Black Horn Lynx are trying to... Hello world, Lindsay here, liaison to the senior partners of Black Horn and Lynx. Let's play Cyberhive. another case, I suppose you'd call it. As judge of the juvenile court, I've handled hundreds. Funny, though, the way you can never get used to them. Take Edie Adams here. She tried to prove she had nerve, ran off with a stranger who promised to marry her. Well, he robbed a building and loan office. The police picked him up, and here she is in my chambers, a delinquent. Delinquent in good sense. <laughs> I can't get over it sometimes, how teenagers can be such suckers. Do you know what a sucker really is? Ask any carnival pitchman. The sucker is the guy who thinks he's smart, that he's putting something over on you. Take the old shell game. The sucker never wins. Why? Because the pea is really a ball of wax. It's never under the shell. It's under the operator's fingernail. All right, what's that got to do with you? You never fell for the shell game. Don't fool yourselves. A lot of you have fallen for it, thrown away a future like nothing in the history of the world. For what? A kick or a flame, a thrill? You think you're smart enough to get away with it, but you're just being a sucker, what I call being delinquent in good sense. Like these two, parked on a lonely road, just looking for trouble, and trouble is there all right. If you look hard enough, you can always find it, especially if you're the sharp one, the guy or gal who doesn't have to listen to your parents' good sense or follow the rules because you're smart enough to beat the game and take care of yourself. That's what this couple thought. Did you read about the case in the newspapers? They found out how it feels to be a sucker. Too late to do any good, but they found out. What they didn't know was that men like this make a practice of lurking in lonely lovers' lanes to prey on young people who don't know any better than to be there. Sometimes the victims are lucky. They lose only money or their jewelry, but not this time. These two were fortunate to get out with their lives, and that's an experience they'll never forget. One case, and there are hundreds more in my files, all normal, average kids who saw their lives ruined in a few hours, or even in minutes. Let's take a look at another one. Mary Hansen. There's nothing wrong with babysitting in itself. It gives parents freedom, it gives you a chance to make some money, and learn how to handle small children. That's true so long as you and your parents know the people. But Mary put an ad in a newspaper for sitting jobs. But the idea of going to a strange home with someone you never saw before just because he answered an ad, well, it's plain idiotic. You wouldn't go away with a stranger for any other reason. 
And just because it's under the guise of babysitting doesn't make it all right. But this time, even Mary's mother is fooled. You see, he gave her a phone number where she could reach her daughter anytime. An hour and a half past time, and Mary isn't home yet. About time to call that number he left you, isn't it, Mrs. Hanson? You think it's silly to worry, don't you? After all, what could happen to Mary on a babysitting job? But the woman who answers the phone has no family. She never even heard of the man or of Mary Hansen. No, she has no idea where the man got this number. And now, Mrs. Hanson, it is time to worry. But I'm afraid it's too late to do any good after letting your daughter drive away with a stranger. Another headline. This one was just last week. It's in my files. You can read about it. Now, let's take another example. Ethel Ryan's case, one of the nicest girls in her school. Like a lot of juniors and seniors, Ethel and her friend Lynn thought they were too sophisticated for boys of their own age. They wanted somebody more glamorous. And the two in the convertible were just what they had in mind. To me, it would seem that the fact they've never seen either of them before should make a difference. Well, it does to Lynn for a minute, but Ethel talks her into it. It's daytime, Ethel says, and aren't they grown up and smart enough to handle any situation? Both of them got home safely. And they're really in luck, Lynn tells her mother. She and Ethel met two of the nicest boys and they're going out with them tonight. Who are they? And where did they meet them, Mrs. Coe asks. Well, Lynn explains, they don't know their names yet. She and Ethel missed their bus and... You mean they picked you up and you don't even know them? Well, her daughter is certainly not going out with strangers. She may be old-fashioned, she tells her daughter, but that's fine. So, Ethel gets the bad news. Len's mother says no. Well, it's tough. But Ethel certainly isn't going to give up a good time even if she has to go alone. Lynn wishes she had a mother like Ethel's, one who never forbids her daughter anything. See you later, Ethel says. Like Mr. and Mrs. Ryan and Ethel herself. And I can tell you about hundreds of cases. I hope you're beginning to get the idea. Mr. and Mrs. Adams are, and Edie too. She's going to a detention home for three months. Plenty of time to think about whether a few minutes of showing off or feeling sharp is worth a lifetime of regrets. If you're willing to risk that, you're not the young American men and women I think you are. Think it over. Why not get really wise, really hip? Don't be a sucker. the graduation speakers see every spring, our town's pretty average. And that goes for our senior class, too. Out of this class of 40, just because it is average, 
two of these boys and girls will spend some part of their lives in a mental institution. My job is to try to keep the people around here healthy, and most of them are. Of course, nobody's ever perfect. Jim Anderson has a bad ear. That doesn't keep him from playing on the football team. County champions last year, too. Frank White is nearsighted, but his glasses take care of that. Dorothy Westerly has a tooth that needs fixing, but she's in good health, I'd say. Mighty good health. They've all learned habits of good living that have helped them stay physically healthy. Habits of cleanliness, good diet, exercise, and rest. But there's another side to good health, and that's good mental health. Comes naturally to most people. Parents who are mentally healthy bring up their children to be mentally healthy, too. Take Tommy Clark there. He learned the first rule for good mental health a long time ago. About Now, when he works up ahead of steam, he puts it to work in a useful way, instead of holding it inside. When you try to do that, it's bound to come out in some unpleasant way. Tommy learned that some years back, just after his younger brother was born. Come on, Jimmy. Have some. Come on. Tommy, eat your meat. You haven't eaten a bite all day. I declare, I don't know what's got into you. You heard your mother, Thomas. Now do as she says. Finally, his folks sent him to see me. There wasn't anything physically wrong with him that I could find, so I began to talk with him. <laughs> like you losing weight, not sleeping. Now, what is it, son? Gosh, Dr. Martinson, this may sound kind of funny to you. No, no, it won't. I don't think my folks want me anymore. They're planning to get rid of me. What makes you think that, son? I heard them say so one night. They thought I was asleep. Ever since Jimmy was born, they... <laughs> well, it wasn't easy to prove to Tommy that he was wrong. As in so many cases like this, his parents were partly to blame. The new baby was taking more of their attention than they realized. I got a chance to talk to Tommy's mother about it, and it turned out that they'd been talking about sending Tommy to camp for the summer, and he misunderstood them. Well, we finally got it straightened out. But it taught Tommy a lesson that many people don't learn so quickly, about not bottling up his emotions. He learned that it could be easy to talk to his folks and that he didn't have to hide his love for them. Good night, Mom. Good night, Tommy. Well, that is quite a few years ago. Tom's graduating today. That number one rule for good mental health, don't bottle up your emotions, has helped him through many a tough spot. Of course, we're talking about some of the simple rules for staying in good mental health. And that brings us to the second rule, which is respecting yourself. Sounds easy, doesn't it? But look what happened to Bruce Matthews. He went out for the tennis team a couple of years ago, and while he had a lot to learn, he had the makings of a fine player. But he wasn't satisfied with slow, steady improvement. Oh, he expected himself to be perfect right from the start. Missing a point would make him boil over at himself. Well, the coach finally caught on to what Bruce was doing to himself with his demand for perfection. Sure, I think it's fine to keep wanting to improve. I understand that, but I think you're going at it the wrong way. How do you mean? Well, did you ever stop to think how good your game really is? Yeah. After missing that last point? That's just what I'm getting at. You're worrying too much about the game and you don't enjoy it. But, gee, coach, I know I can do better. Sure you can, but the point is you shouldn't let yourself get mad every time you miss a point. Even the world's champion can't make every point. You can't be perfect. You've got to learn to get more pleasure out of this game. So take yourself as you are, and instead of expecting yourself to be perfect. It took a while for Bruce to get what the coach was driving at. But little by little, without letting up one bit on trying to improve his game, he learned to enjoy his skill rather than fret over his occasional misses. Yes. He's learning that second important habit for keeping in good health. Good mental health, I mean. The habit of feeling right about himself. 
Along with that goes a third important habit. Feeling right about other people, too. That means getting along with others, having fun with them, being part of the group. There's no room for bashfulness in good mental health. To look at Otto Markle there, you'd never guess what he was like a year ago. For some reason or other, he was convinced that people just didn't like him much. He never tried to make friends or to be one of the bunch. It was Miss Reinert who came to Otto's rescue. I think you'd enjoy getting into one of the school clubs. I don't know. I really don't have any time. I hear they're planning to organize a camera club. You could help with that. I'm not very good with my camera. I don't think they'd want me in the club. Of course they would. The more the better when you're organizing a club. Gosh, Miss Reiner. You're certainly doing well in chemistry, and that's important in photography. I don't know. Chemistry's different from photography. I think you'll find they'd welcome a good chemist like you in a camera club. But you'll have to do one thing. What's that? Offer to help. Do all you can to help get the club organized. Get some other students to join. Oh, I couldn't do that. Of course you can. And you'll find that they'll like you as much as you like them. I knew about Otto's problem because his parents had come to see me about the same thing. Of course, they had to share the responsibility for Otto's bashfulness. What do you mean, George? I don't quite get what you're driving at. No? Well, I'll tell you, Art. I've been watching you with that kid a long time. You're demanding too much from him. Nobody can be perfect, so don't ride him so hard. When he does something you don't like, remember he's a person in his own right. His way may be just as good as your way. I do think you've been hard on him at times, Arthur. Oh, but he doesn't toe the line the way he should. He has advantages I never had when I was a boy. He has an opportunity to amount to something. But let him do it his own way. You've got him feeling now he isn't as good as the next fella. That's why he hesitates to make friends. In all those cases, in many others I've known, talking with the parents was important in helping to get things straightened out. He's learning the third basic rule for good mental health, feeling right about other people. That means that in any normal group of people, there is a feeling of give and take. There's an interest in the group as a whole. There's no distrust or dislike of others just because they happen to be different. Well, there's one more rule for good mental health. And I see that Nancy's finally learned it well enough to get her diploma. That's the habit of doing something about a problem as soon as it comes up. Class of Gosh, what I don't know about the Civil War period. I haven't cracked a page in two weeks. I'm gonna have to dig into this one, too. Come on over to my house tonight. Let's study it together. Oh, I just dread getting into it. Let's put it off till tomorrow. Well, all right. Tomorrow never came for Nat's quiz. They found her completely unprepared. But Barbara had faced up to that quiz the day it was announced. Oh, Jay, I've been so worried about this exam. I, I just can't sleep. Oh, I hope I pass. There's no point in worrying about it now. Nancy not only had double trouble with that quiz, she had triple trouble, before, during, and after. She'd got busy just as soon as it was announced, instead of just worrying about it, it would have been a lot easier for her. Yes, the people around here are learning some of the basic rules for staying in good mental health. First rule is, don't bottle up your emotions like love, fear, anger. Express them naturally. Of course, emotions like anger have to be expressed with consideration for others. Above all, don't carry a grudge. Get it off your chest. The second rule is to respect your own abilities. Always try to improve, but remember that you're human. The third rule is to respect others. Treat them as friends. And finally, when a problem shows up, face it at once, calmly, reasonably, and honestly. And remember that one of the best rules for good mental health is talking out your troubles and problems with someone whose opinion you respect, your parents. 
Your family doctor, your school teacher or advisor. Your clergyman may be the right person to talk to on many things. Whoever it may be, talking is one of the best tonics there is for good mental health. Another good tonic is an interesting hobby. It gives you a way to relax, a chance to accomplish something you can be proud of. Well, those are some of the rules for staying in good mental health. Of course, they're just the ABCs of a subject big enough to fill whole libraries. But as more and more folks get to know these ABCs and follow them, they're going to be able to look at a group like this someday and feel that they have a greater chance than ever for the kind of happy, useful life which will make our world a better place to live in. Scientists of the world have freely exchanged their knowledge. This worldwide search for truth has led to the greatest of all discoveries, atomic energy. No one scientist or nation is responsible. The periodic law of the elements was discovered relativity by Einstein, a German. The atomic nucleus by Rutherford, a New Zealander. Atomic structure by the Dane, Niels Bohr. Positron by Anderson of the United States. The neutron by Chadwick of Great Britain. Artificial radioactivity by the Joliots of France. Uranium was transmuted by Fermi of Italy. The mesotron theory was developed by Yukawa in Japan. Barium was derived from uranium by Hahn of Germany. Uranium was split by Meitner of Austria. This pooling of knowledge is shared by all. There is no secret. When a neutron strikes, the atom is split. Released neutrons split other atoms. The result is atomic energy. Shall the people of the world use this energy for the destruction or the betterment of mankind? The United States used this power to destroy Hiroshima. A flash, a blast, the release of deadly radioactive rays. And in a matter of seconds, downtown New York would be a mass of ruin. Throughout the entire lower end of Manhattan, most people would be dead. All buildings from Washington Square to the Battery would be destroyed. In Chicago, from Halsted Street to Lake Michigan and from Chicago Avenue to Roosevelt Road, the city would lie in ruins. In San Francisco, devastation would be complete from Pacific Avenue to Townsend Street and from Van Ness Avenue to the Ferry Building. One atomic bomb did this to a city and its people. Even 
the most ruthless aggressors of the past had no such weapon. A soldier of Alexander with one spear killed one. Napoleon's cannon in one firing killed 12. The Kaiser's big Bertha killed 88. Hitler's V2 168. Japan's war against the United States ended after a B-29 dropped one atomic bomb that killed close to 100,000. Deadly power can be exerted at great distances. The first atomic bomb was dropped on a round trip of 3,000 miles on August 1945. On November 20th of that year, the effective range was extended to 8,000 miles. The United States had demonstrated that an atomic bomb could be launched to reach any country in the world. A grim reminder to all nations that had the bomb and this plane been in possession of the Axis powers, they could have conquered the world. There would have been no defense against this weapon. A single plane could have broken through to destroy the heart of London. V2s with atomic warheads could have destroyed England. At the moment of surrender, Hitler had in the blueprint stage transoceanic rockets, which could have destroyed our city. U-boats could have surfaced off our shores and launched atomic rockets against vital targets. The fifth column would have had an even more insidious means of destruction. Parts of bombs could have been smuggled in, and under the cloak of darkness, infernal machines could have been assembled by saboteurs. It is therefore an imperative necessity that all the nations of the world unite to avert catastrophe. The United Nations must establish a worldwide control of atomic energy and of other weapons of mass destruction. of the world must together make laws which will abolish war, laws which will hold the individual in all lands responsible for crime against world peace. Only through proper control of atomic energy can we answer the question how this great force may be used for the benefit of mankind. Atomic energy freed from the menace of war, can be for all people in all nations the great fusing force of one world. The choice is clear. It is life or death. You know, Raoul, 
I can tell you what's wrong with the country today. It's the machine age. Everywhere you look, it's machines, machines, machines. That's the trouble. The machines have got all the jobs. And there's only one solution. We've got to quit making machines, put padlocks on those we've got, and give the jobs back to the men. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Ed. Oh, uh, let me show you something over here. Have you ever been in this donut shop? No? <laughs> I like donuts, Ed, but donuts don't like me. Well, Lowell, there's something here that gives a lot of people indigestion of a different kind. And I'll tell you what it is. It's a mechanical gadget that can make more donuts in 10 minutes than mother could make in 10 days. Well, well, the old sinker has gone mechanical. Say, that machine's a honey, isn't it? Well, it certainly does everything. Except one thing, you still have to dunk them yourself. Oh, please, Lowell, I'm serious. That machine is only a sample of what's wrong with the country. What do you mean, uh, too many donuts? No, too many machines. Why, everywhere you look. Some machines doing the work that ought to be done by men. Everything's machine, machine, machine. The things got out of control. We've created a monster that's putting us all out of jobs. And I'll tell you, Lowell... All right, Ed, I'll be serious. As old Abe Martin used to say, it's amazing how a few facts will break up an argument. And the trouble is, a lot of us don't get the whole picture. You know, I wish you had been with me in the workshop of an old friend the other afternoon. He's retired now, living on a pension from the company that used to employ him as a foreman in its machine shops. But he still putters around, just because he loves machines. His son came in, accompanied by a friend with a point of view just like yours. Dad, uh, Ted here wants us to go back to the good old days. He's got it all figured out that machines are ruining the country. <laughs> Carl warned me that you'd give me an argument on that, Mr. Ryan. Of course, I don't mean we don't need some machinery, but just look at us today. Everything we used is made by somebody pushing a button. Why, if a machine run by one man can do 12 men's work, then that's 11 men's jobs gone. Now, that's just arithmetic, isn't it? Mm, maybe. They say figures don't lie. And certainly in the last 30 years, we've been putting in millions of labor-saving machines. So there must be tens of millions less jobs than in the old days. Sure. Why, there just aren't any jobs compared with, well, say, 50 or 60 years back. No. Let's just look at the record. Way back in 1870, it took 324 people working out of every thousand to produce all the things we needed. Then the next 60 years, we went machine mad, like Ted says. Till nowadays, those machines must have put most everybody out of work. But what's the facts? Why, now we have 400 factory workers employed out of every thousand people. Just Ted, that means more men working with machines than without them. Sure it does. But some folks still think that machines destroy jobs. Now, I've been doing a lot of reading on that question. You see, since machines came in, we don't work such long hours. We all get time to do a little more reading. The fact is that machines increase the supply of things we need and give us the time to use them. For every job they take away, they make at least one new job and maybe more. New jobs and better jobs. And don't forget, it takes men to make the machines, to produce the increased amount of raw materials needed, and to sell, transport, and handle the increased volume of product. Now I remember back in my old hometown, we had two blacksmiths, busy most of the time, fixing wagons, shoeing horses and such. Blacksmith worked 14 hours a day and made a living if he was lucky. He certainly wasn't renowned as an employer of labor. The horse and buggy business kept about 11 men working in our town, what with the two blacksmiths, two livery stables, and the feed store. So those 11 men never dreamed they'd have their jobs shot out from under them by this goofy looking contraption. They said the horseless carriage business was just a fad. Couldn't last. The darn thing would blow up. Cost too much anyhow. But today, that town's got six filling stations, two repair shops, and an accessory store with steady jobs for 37 men, where 11 used to live off the horse and buggy. A lot more people in that town are working for the electric light company, where there wasn't this in the good old days. And there's a dozen stores on Main Street giving work to a hundred more people in place of the two people who used to work in the old general store. Why? 
because the machines have made all kinds of new things that people need and made so many of them that the price can be brought down where everybody can buy those things. Same with the automobile. How many cars were sold when they were mostly handmade? It wasn't much of an industry in those days because a man had to be wealthy to buy one. Today, machine production has provided some kind of a car for almost every family in America. There are over 20 million passenger cars on the roads today. Yeah, but how about the wagon drivers, the blacksmiths, and all those folks that lost their jobs because of the automobile? That's an honest question. Let's go inside where we can get the honest facts. Sit down, boy, and make yourself comfortable. Now, as I remember it, 1900 was the top year for the horse and buggy business. Let's see what the almanac says. Mm, here we are. It shows that about one million people were working as drivers, wagon makers, stable hands, and so forth. Now compare that one million jobs. And tough jobs they were, too, with almost three million jobs made by the automobile. Three times as many new jobs as the old jobs that were wiped out. Now let's look at some of the other job eater uppers. In almost any office, you will find two machines that will certainly let one office worker do at least the work of two or three working by hand. Yeah, the typewriter and the adding machine must have tossed millions of office people out of jobs. In 1860, with no office machines, it took 4,369 clerks, bookkeepers, and so on for every million population. Now bring on your machines and watch those poor office workers get fired. Well, by Jiminy, 49,805 office workers instead of 4,000 or so per million population. Just 11 times as many as before they started doing their work by machine. But even with all the modern machinery we've got, we haven't begun to meet the demand for all the needs. Surveys by big industries have proved that even in 1929, our biggest year, we only produced about half enough the things our people need to give them the living standards they are working toward. And this doesn't even count the new industries just being born today. In a thousand laboratories, in big industries everywhere, men are working all the time to find ways to do things better and easier. Scientists and engineers are creating new jobs by perfecting new formulas and new machines. The chemists discovered how to spin a stream of liquid into a thread of rayon, and all of a sudden, right out of nowhere, we have an industry that created 109,000 jobs and $97 million in wages between 1913 and 1934. And that's just one example. In late years, we've seen 18 new industries giving jobs to 10 million men and women. You know them yourself. Automobiles, electrical apparatus, gasoline, typewriters, mechanical refrigerators, and a lot of others. Instead of destroying jobs, machines have made more of them. And right here you have the answer to why you and I, both of us, average American working men, enjoy the highest living standards of any working men in the world. 14 million of us own our own homes. Four out of five families own cars. Most of us have telephones, electric lights, and a thousand other comforts of life, besides insurance policies and saving accounts. All this progress has come because the machine has given us mass production so that everybody can enjoy the good things we produce. Why, we're sitting on top of the world, we Americans. And that's the story, Ed, from an old-timer who has been through the mill. You see, here in America, we have always worked on the idea that the best way to get ahead is to follow one simple rule. Multiply wealth, produce more of the world's goods, so that everybody can have a bigger share. Mass production. And that means more machines and bigger ones, bigger factories and more men on the payroll than we have ever seen before. That's what machines mean to America, Ed more of the good things of life, and more jobs for all of us.